boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time, apparently with reason. This is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and I have with me a guest that I'm really excited to talk with today. Uh, It's going to be, I think, an eye-opener for some of you. Uh, I hope it changes some people's opinions, honestly, of what they hold now. Um, She has lived in Canada for 13 years. Um, Still there, actually. She has studied at Arcadia University and the University of New Brunswick, which are both schools in Canada. She has a PhD in English literature. Um, and she's, she's finishing up there looking to actually move back to Florida, which is her home. Uh, so she is an American, but she's had that Canadian experience, a, a very extended experience that most of us probably would never have. Um, and she has also worked with uh, healthcare in that field as well up in Canada. She is looking to volunteer in New York. Uh, as a as a healthcare worker, if if she can get the rate uh, the bureaucracy to agree with credentialing process, that she could help out with the pandemic going up there, and she is also looking to um, uh, once again enter into the arena of a radio with Rebecca on the radio show that she will have started up shortly upon coming to the states. She actually used to be on Canadian radio uh, for a time, and then actually is where. Uh, we had our interview. Uh, I want to I want to introduce to you today uh, Rebecca Quelos, and Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, so my last name is pronounced Cuevas with a A. Uh, everybody does Cuevos because it sounds like Cuervo, but <laughs> I am not tequila. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the things that I just want to point out the bureaucracy of going to New York is actually pretty open. Um, It's not that big of a hurdle um, as it would seem. It's a matter of, you know, checking my credentials. Should I be there? Because last thing you want is somebody who doesn't have any training whatsoever showing up. So um, I'm at stage two where I'm waiting to talk to a nurse or they'll give me my assignment. So it's moving along pretty quickly. And May 11th to the 16th is when they said I should plan for departure. So we'll see how it goes. That's good to hear. And I'm glad you clarified that. Um, so I'm not sure how any of that worked. It would just seem like a nightmare to me, but I hope they expedite that so that you can actually get to work in that field. And I appreciate that you'd volunteer to actually do that in this time. Uh, actually, our, our roles are reversed today because uh, the last time we were in this setting, uh, you were the host and I was the guest from your show uh, that for the station you was on in Canada. And um, you had me on to talk about apparently a dangerous subject in the region uh, called religion. Uh, And I was basically sharing my insights uh, about religion, uh, particularly from a Christian perspective. And we were just having an open dialogue about that. Um, But there was a Uh reaction to that uh, show, to that particular episode, um, what did you have to go through as a result of our interview on your show? Um, well, as near as I can place it, that was the show that kicked off my own very personal experience of what censorship is like. Um, I was thinking about, well, before we came to this interview, uh, how big the fallout was. And it was massive. Um, So I was working at the station as well as doing my own show. Um, And I do not believe in political correct speech. I think people should speak clearly. They should speak plainly. And the reason why is I find political correctness has been used as a way to aid people who are abusive, um, oppressive, um, who want to take people's rights away it's been used as probably one of the most effective tools I've come across to date. So you can't really speak your mind. And if you speak your mind, you're kind of brought up, um, you're brought up to the, to to the podium and made to make an account of yourself. And you're facing just a barrage of people who have the intention of harm. They don't have the intention of good intentions to make you, understand what harm you're doing to someone else. That's not the agenda. The agenda is to silence and control the narrative. It's all a power play. 
Um, so my first experience leading up to this was I was talking to someone and they had a radio program for kids and they would bring kids from the community in, but they didn't bring any troubled children in, like no troubled kids. And I called them troubled kids. And that apparently was the very first error that I did. And this would have been just a few days before you and I um, spoke. So that kind of raised on the radar that, oh, this is one of those clear speaking people who just says their mind. And I had to back them down because I know how to play the game. I've got more cards in my pocket than most. So I let them know that I was a troubled child. And on top of that, I happen to be Hispanic immigrant um, woman, single parent who's like, I was just like unloading my cards because that's the game liberals play. And I was like, oh, you want to play this? Oh, you happen to be gay. Well, let me unload on you. And then I, you know, I'm like sapiosexual. And they're like, what the heck does that mean? And I was like, well, if you don't know, you're the problem. Not <laughs> So I backed them down, but it did raise me on the radar that I needed to be watched. Unfortunately, it wasn't just me. My son also had a radio show. It raised him on the radar um, because a lot of times we would do shows together because we're a political family. So he went down in the fray. Um, they slaughtered a couple people in the office besides me. <laughs> they, they got lost in the cause. Um, a, couple, a bunch of people on the radio that were DJs that were partnered to me. They got got rid of like there was like that. I was the first one to go down. So I was the canary in the coal mine. But they got rid of a bunch of people. And it all came back to that you do not adhere to my totalitarian mentality. So when you and I had our show, they did not take kindly to it because of the way we, well, I, not you, I handled the material. They were like, you did not do proper citation. And I was like, I'm pretty sure we were referencing the Bible. Like Gideon's Bibles are everywhere. Just pick up a Bible. Like it's radio. Like how do you do other than say, go to this section of the Bible? Or if we were referencing news, we would say, oh, you know, um, the New York Times said blah, blah, blah. You know, it's simple. Go Google New York Times says blah, blah, blah. And it'll pop right up in the feed. Right. And then I would post my podcast with all of the relevant references there and post it online so people could follow up. And and that was the beginning of it that I got called into the office. I was questioned. I was grilled. They wanted to teach me. They wanted to teach me um, how they expected me to handle <laughs> and speak. And I was like, no, because as you know, I'm an American and I do believe in free speech. I don't have to agree with people, but I will fight to the bitter end for you to have that. And that does not exist in Canada. Yeah, that, that definitely caught me off guard when you shared that experience with me after you, well, you were still in the middle of it. You had, uh, I mean, you're basically telling me, you had to submit to basically like a re-education, how to think and what to properly say if you wanted to continue to work there. And that if you did not agree with that, well, you weren't going to work there. Is that correct? Uh, well, I was on contract. So the majority of the government un um, institutions here do you an annual contract. So I was pretty far into my contract where we just wrote it out. Um, it was a ho super hostile environment uh, mm -hmm. after that. So I would come in and at one point I was just like, you know, F the police. I'm just going to go do what I want. You don't want me in the office. I don't want to be in the office. Fire me if you want to. And I did. And I just I wrote the rest of my contract the last, I would say, three months. I never showed up for work. I didn't do anything. And they were so happy to get rid of me that they did. And I, I mean, we took this to human rights um, and the human rights here. They always side with the government. So you have the government protecting the government, right? And the university is also government. So it's very corrupt because it's so incestuous. The government universities and the um, are funded by the government. So I went to two other universities, Acadia, as you mentioned, but also Mount Allison. Mount Allison has a reputation of being the Harvard of Canada. So they're autonomous because they don't depend on the government. Whereas UMB does not. And boy, do they kowtow and toe the line, the government line. So if you try to fight with the university and you approach the human rights board or the ombudsman, well, I can tell you from experience, they're coming down on the side of the university because they protect their own. That's, that's I'm glad that they have that in, in that apparent uh, sea of uh, government uh, 
control of everything. In fact, um, on this interview, you, you've told me before we began that uh, if there's issues with the internet and and our lag time, it's probably on my end. And you explained how there's such a stifling government presence in the internet that it's it's often throttled. You can't use it very effectively to do proper research, which in your field is very necessary. Uh, if do, Is it things like that in Canada where there's such a government presence that it's almost like they control what you want to hear, say, and do? Oh, they, they definitely control what you hear, say, and do. And when I said that they come down on the side of the university, I mean they defend the university, not, not the victim, ever. In my experience, ever. I've seen students run out of university um, via abuses, uh, human rights abuses and stuff. So they're not, they're no friend to the everyday Joe and the lower you are. I happen to be a very public person so that I'm very, it's very limited what they can do to me, right? Published author. Uh, I know people in media and they'll report it, but what gets carried in media is very different. So you can find anything we talk about between us, you can find it, but you have to strategically go and look for it because like, the way YouTube now is suppressing videos, they're there, but they throttle them. Same thing happens here. So anything that I said, like the fact that Canada is sending old people home to die because we our um, health system is collapsing, or the fact that this was happening even before the COVID pandemic, that we have a failure in our health system, it's there. If you go and you Google it, and you use certain keywords. So it's not, it's m making the algorithm work for you is instead of depending on the algorithm, which is programmed. And there's ways you can, like I've, I've worked in media and bumping and, and marketing. So I understand how to bring a page to the top, but you can counter that if you have the proper tools in the education and it's not that hard, right? So you go and you strategically look behind the, the curtain and see what is there. So everything I'm saying is like, it's there, it's provable. And I do this quite often when I'm chatting on my Facebook, you know, I have a super political Facebook page and people say, oh, that's not true. And I'm like, here, have this like deluge of information. And I'll just like post, 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 but then they shut up and they're like, well, you're just looking for that. I'm like, that's the question you asked, man. So, but yeah, they tried to use a form of re-education. That's good. I never thought about that. I mean, you know, me, I'm just typical American. I'm like, you can't tell me what to do. They can here. <laughs> Right. Just so you know. And right. it's interesting whenever I listen to politicians trying to push how great Canada is. And it is great. Like, don't get me wrong. There's mm -hmm. things that are quite beautiful about living here. Freedom of expression, um, the ability to criticize um, your government is not one of them. Wow. I, I believe that's a misconception that uh, many in this nation have. Uh, I think we often view Canadians as basically they're like Americans, but over there type mentality. Um, and we don't as a nation really understand they have different um, mindsets and perceptions about how government's supposed to function about there. They're a subject where we see ourselves as a citizen. Uh, they're govern They still have a monarch and answer to the Queen of England in some way, they're considered a dominion. They're not even technically their own nation, though they kind of are. It's it's a weird relationship. Um, but the idea, like you've mentioned in our country is, uh, well, they're just like us, but they have better stuff. Um, to speak more to that, is that, a, is that a very good observation or is that totally off? Um, I would say that even Canadians have that perception. They believe they have the freedom of speech. But if you go and you look at the Charter of Human Rights that they have here, which an interesting fact that most people don't know, I live in St. John, New Brunswick, which is right on the coast. And just up the way from me is a place called Hampton, New Brunswick. The original Charter of Human Rights upon which the Constitution of the United States at the, at the bequest of one of our leading ladies, I forget which one of our first ladies it was, asked this gentleman to write the Charter of Human Rights. It was pinned here in New Brunswick, which is now like the garbage pit of Canada. Like this is an amazing place. I said, there's some things here and nobody ever talks about this. Even Canadians are unaware of these facts. But the Charter of Human Rights does not enshrine those inalienable rights. And it doesn't secure 
the right of freedom of expression, the freedom of speech, the way we do, because we it's all in the second, first amendment, first amendment, um, the right to bear arms. Like you don't have that inalienable, nobody can take these rights away from you foundation. These are governed by and at the behest of your governing body. So they give you ambiguous terms like freedom of expression. Well, they get to decide what expression is. You don't get to decide that and how free your expression is. They also get to decide that. And when you think about the fact that the main TV or media sources are either controlled by the government or by big, huge oil industries for like New Brunswick. Like I, I have no, I have a lot of things that I really like about the Irving oil company. But one of the things that I don't like is that they control media and they will just squash anybody who criticizes them. And they own all the media from like Quebec all the way over to Nova Scotia, all the way up. And they have the power to call the premier when he doesn't do what he's supposed to do up on the phone and have him make an account of himself. So it's a very, it's those kind of very incestuous things that actually squashes the right of the everyday average person to criticize, to vocalize, to ask questions. Um, we're in the middle right now of the city I live next to going bankrupt. So I live in an area with the five richest cities or neighborhoods in all of Canada. Right next to me is St. John, which has some of the poorest. And I mean, when I say right next to, I don't mean like there's a bunch of factories in between, like, you know, the United States, we set up these little barriers. It is right next to, and people from here go into town and work there and come home. They're selling off the city's energy source. And the people have no recourse to fight that. They'll hold a town hall. They basically tell, this is what we're going to do. You can say whatever you want to say. And they're like, oh yeah, but we're not going to listen to you. And they do whatever they want. So taxpayers have no, no recourse to fight back. All they can do is complain. And even that is mediated through social media, right? Because if you go on Facebook, it moderate it moderates and removes posts, right? You could just make a complaint. I could do it. Like I could go on your Facebook and you say, good morning, everybody. I'll be like offensive, right? And so then it gets removed. And if people just keep doing that, eventually, you know, it's gone long enough that Facebook moves on and the rate that media moves on, these things just pass by. And so it's very interesting to me that, you know, even Canadians have the mentality that they have the rights like an American, that they have access to legal representation and a voice in um, government like Americans. Mm -hmm. And it's categorically false. Um, and I, it wasn't until I actually took into the university and showed a class what our voting ballot looks like compared to their voting ballot, which they have a card. They vote who in their party they want representing them. The end. No taxes, no lawyers, no judges, no nothing. It's like you you kind of push a button and hope for the best and hope it works out for you. But that's what kind of leads to that corruption, because there is no power for the people. There is no. Uh, like we have the Congress, Senate, and the presidency, right? And there's a there's a balance there. Here, the premier can do whatever the hell he wants. Like he just took AR-15s away because they had a very unfortunate, it was a very sad shooting by a gentleman who got his hands on illegal weapons. So of course, like following what the Democrats would do, the liberals, they take away the rights of gun owners, legal gun owners. No debate. No legislate. He just goes, and that's what I'm going to do. And people can do nothing about it. Nothing. Okay. So even Canadians feel that they have that, but they do not. Okay. I'm, I'm, um, it sparks a curiosity in me and, and, uh, maybe you, you can, uh, you can troubleshoot this if, if I have a right perception on what you're saying. Um, basically mm -hmm. their concept of rights is based upon the notion of a charter where the governing authority says we agree to give you these rights under the premise that we can revoke those rights if we feel necessary. Whereas in our mindset, like you said, we have inalienable rights. These are rights that are not to be taken away, not even by governing authorities. Uh, in fact, I mean, our constitution says this is given to us by our creator, which means if you don't outrank him, you can't take them. Um, but in their mindset, the rights they possess are basically concessions from the government, not actual rights. Am I correct in that assumption? 
I think that's a fair way to read it, especially in the way that it is practiced. Because there is a thing in law, like there is the letter of the law, which the United States tends to be a letter of the law country. We do interpret it to some point, but you're very limited on how far you can do the interpretations. Where here, it is really what does the new premier, what is how does he feel like he wants to interpret what is said? What is like, what is a freedom of expression? Is it a shirt? Is it a hat? Like, what is that? What does that really mean? Um, and so, yeah, it, it is definitely at, you know, at, if, if it's at the pleasure of whoever is the ruling party. Definitely. The interesting thing I find about Americans, the interesting thing I find about Americans is that um, we think all human beings should have these rights. And that that is like you are human. You should have these rights. You're right. Yeah, we're and we're caught off guard when um, we we see these other nations that uh, again some want to emulate, and it, it's like a shot to the gut that well they don't have these type of rights, and and this uh, this notion of utopia you're talking about doesn't exist there like you think it does. Um, they have, like you said, they have some great things that are nice. Mm -hmm but so do we. And, but they have to trade in these things yep. to have whatever they have and, and they complain about it too. But the difference is, is their complaint is like, that's nice. Whereas here, our voice can actually be mobilized to do something about it. it um, in, so in Canada, what, of the, your understanding of the political system there, the, the people really have no recourse to address their government in any way to, to make changes? Not really, no. So for example, say we don't like Donald Trump giving poor people money to survive. I mean, I can't imagine, I'm no, I can't imagine people like that because I've met, I've met them, um, you know, uh, but imagine we take a, we take a problem and we're like, you know what, I'm offended by that. We're going to do something about it. We can go make a petition, have the petition signed if we get the, the required amount of petition, we could put it before the Congress and the Senate, and then they have to hear ourselves. But they have to, they have to listen to us. They have to consider our position and our arguments. They owe us a voice on the floor. Like the Congress and the Senate is not some holy land that, you know, like um, uh, Mecca, where only certain men are allowed to tread only with their shoes off, women on the outside. Like it's not that kind of a setup, right? And I use that as an extreme because here, that is pretty much how it is. You are not allowed to enter those halls unless you're invited. And when you're invited, you better behave as if, as expected, or you will be removed. You have no recourse. Whereas some of the demonstrations in the United States right now about the shutdown, is it extreme? Yes, it is. Was it necessary at the time? Yes, it was, because we were lied to by by China. So we have this rampant disease that's asymptomatic, but the American people are like, what about my inalienable rights? I have the right to live my life, life, liberty, and the pursuit mm -hmm. of happiness. It's just endemic to the way we are. And has it gone on too long? These are the questions, right? So people can show up mm -hmm. at the Capitol behave poorly, even Democrats, whenever the pussy hatters marched up on Washington, screaming and culturally appropriating black people's speech, which was awful. Uh, they have that right. And like I said, I don't have to like it, obvious by what I just said, but I will fight for you to have that right to freedom of speech, protesting, and even up to carrying guns. Just because an American has a firearm does it? We don't automatic, automatically think this is a crazy lunatic who's going to shoot somebody. It's endemic to our culture that we protect ourselves through military grade weaponry. You know, the, the amendment that guarantees our right to bear arms is not about us being able to hunt. It is not about us being able to protect our house from an intruder. It is our right to bear arms against our government so the government does not infringe upon those rights. And people always misrepresent that. And for the longest time, even gun owners and gun rights activists were misrepresenting that. And I was like, say the truth. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. I'll clarify this for me. You, you were saying uh, they have elections there. They do. 
but it's almost as if it doesn't matter that they have the election. What's different about the Canadian political system? Because, I mean, in my American head, I'm thinking, okay, I don't like the way you all are running things. You didn't listen to what I was saying. You ignored everything. We got enough of us together to vote you out and put in different people. Is right. that not how it works there? What, what am I missing? Um, well, I think indoctrination from, cause that's one of the things that I study, right? Ideology in literature. How does this work? Wow. I think indoctrination starts at a very young age. Um, they have people to where they're very much married to that two party system. There used to be three. Um, they pretty much got it boiled down to two. Um, and it starts early. Like my parent, what, my mother was a Democrat, so I'm a Democrat and so on and so forth back to, you know, since we sailed across the ocean blue kind of mentality. Um, there is a very strong, and you're starting to see this. And that's what it, one of the tactics of socialism when it tries to take over a country is it always pits, it divides and it conquers. Uh, if it's not successful, like what's happened in the United States, you'll start to see it eat its own which is what's happening. Like everybody's like free for all. The democratic liberal party is starting to attack its own because it doesn't work. The rest of us who are more conservative minded, more traditional American appreciating the constitution, we don't care what they say anymore. And this has been going on for like three years. Um, and that was one of the last radio broadcasts I did um, as I interviewed a, pr a professor who got chased out of the university for criticizing China. It turns out like three or four years later, he was right and they were wrong and they were like, that's racism. I'm like, no, that's money laundering. What the heck does that have to do with it? Hispanics do that? Like white people do that? Like, is, like, is that just the specifically Chinese trait that makes you a racist? But um, the fact that whenever you go to the poll to vote and you're already mentally programmed to vote team liberal or to vote team conservative. So the conservatives would be our Republicans and the liberals would be our Democrats. And yes, they do support and trade each other, trade with each other. So they actually fund each other, which should be illegal. That should be, that is high. That should be highly illegal uh, because it's foreign government interference with a domestic election. That should be illegal. Here it's not even spoken about. They think it's great. Um, they were all up on the Obama campaign. Um, so it goes so deep and it's so hard to pick people out of that. Like that's a great deal of my public discussion is get, trying to force people to think critically, to force people to question the ideology. So when they go to the poll, there will be people that are represented, that are presented to them that have already passed. So kind of like the Democrats, the Democrats decide who run. The DNC does. It's not the people. The people's vote doesn't count for anything other than show up at the polls and help us win. Very much the system that you have here. You're given people who are already vetted. They're already approved. They've met the check lines. They've shook the hands of all the power holders and they've already made their bargains. So everything they say to you, then it's just motivation to get you to stay on team liberal or, or conservative and show up at the polls and put them in office. And then after that, Whatever they do, it doesn't matter what they said. They're going to do what they're going to do. And there is nothing you can do about it. In fact, there isn't even a term. You have to wait for a vote of no confidence from the people in the system. <laughs> so they get mad and they get greedy. And that's what usually does it. They, they get mad, they get greedy. And somebody will put it through a vote of no confidence. And it's really interesting to watch it play out in the pandemic situation because you have uh, premiers. Um, so people who are in charge of it would be the equivalent of our governors. You have them breaking and just doing whatever they want. And of course, you know, the government can't control anything right now. So Doug Ford is a great example. He's a conservative and he decided he was not going to buy any more PPE from China. Ch Canada is still doing that because they're economically behest and beholden to China. So they really can't stop. Mm -hmm. They don't have a choice. They tried. And he started manufacturing his own. He decided he was going to, you know, purchase ventilators and do that. And he even had, he was ballsy. He told America when they opened the border, we don't want you here <laughs> because he <laughs> just cares about Ontario. And, you know, like Donald Trump, whenever that happened with one of the states, he was like, right. that's his job. His job is to protect the people of Ontario. That's his job. But 
he is so counter and boy does he catch heat in the media they don't give him credit they say he's bullheaded he's canada's trump and you know that he doesn't care about his people it's like the same nonsense right so after a while everybody's numb to this now nobody cares nobody cares what gets me is uh as an american my theory is is as you've said, it, you mentioned ideology and literature, but it's ideology and basically uh, expression, how things are crafted to, to put you on a track to think and act a certain way by filtering what you receive and suppressing what mm -hmm. I don't want you to receive, which to me is mm -hmm. absolutely un-American in uh, the, the work of scoundrels and violence. And I'm a... Uh, absolutely. What bothers me is mm -hmm. in this country, there's like this growing, I don't, I don't know what it is, drive, if you will, to become like somebody else. Canada's on that list. Sometimes you hear Germany, Sweden, mm -hmm. once in a blue moon, UK, if you're not paying attention to everything else going on there or what, whatever it is, we, we should be like this nation. They have this, they have that. Most of the time, the people saying it having visited there, much less lived there. They haven't talked with anybody who lives there. Um, Canada is definitely one of those prominent examples of if we were just like them, life would be just so much better than what we have in this raggedy country called the United States going on. I mean, they have this, they have that, this is going on. Mm -hmm. But what concerns me is the things you're talking about with the high-handed political actions the clear suppression of speech, the uh, the ability of the people to have no recourse to even confront their government. There's this idea that your rights, yeah, they're there, but eh, they don't have to be type of attitude. Uh, I see that growing here, and, and you you said you you study you study this uh, the ideology aspect of communication, which is which really has got my so curiosity. Do, do you see that kind of uh, play, mm -hmm. if you will, to, to seize all the uh, factors of influence in this country and control the ideology? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I do. Um, so when you were, when you were just talking, one of the things you did is a lot of people do is there's this, and my kids went through this phase too. There's this kind of, assumption that literature isn't a problem. And I'm here to tell you right now, literature is a big problem because when you think literature, most people think book, a poem, but you have different factors. You have oral literature, right? So the stories we tell orally, um, media, so history, I would say, because we pick and choose what is put into this book is a form of literature. Um, newspaper, because we're, na we're narrating, we're not reporting what happened. Now we narrate, our media has changed. Um, those powerful com companies that hire script writers in California and they pick and choose and decide what we see, how we see it, everything is mediated and it's all has that literary component to it. So if you have this reinforcing where you see it in the news and then it's represented and reinforced in TV, which is the two people, the two ways most people get information now, like most people are and they're trained to be this way. I don't fault people for this, but how many people have actually read as an adult and refresh their memory on what their constitutional rights are and all the amendments that go with it and the federalist papers like most people don't understand and they say well that's boring yeah well you know being a free citizen and practicing law lies on that boring the boring and the mundane is the most powerful because underneath the sensationalism and the sparkle of literature and a story told that's the delivery system that really boring stuff is underlying that. There is a message being sent to you. What I really, one of my underhanded goals, how about that, if you will, is why I wanted to interview you mm -hmm. was uh, the typical knee-jerk response of, well, you're a white supremacist, doesn't apply to you. It's like nope. you said, you, you have a Cuban background, you immigrant, uh, you know, well, you're you're a misogynist. Well, then you hate your own kind being a woman. I guess that they can't yeah. use that against you. Uh, well, you must be this dumb hick from the hill somewhere and have no culture. Yeah. Uh, you grew up in Florida. You've lived in Canada. Well, maybe you're not educated. 
Well, you have a PhD. Uh, well, maybe she went to this conservative school that doesn't really teach stuff. You went to, you have a PhD from a very liberal college in Canada. Yep. And and I, I kind of like this because this immediately removes any typical soundbite response designed to, I don't have to answer you. I win because you're this type of response. They now have to engage you exactly with what you said mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. based upon the, what you, your testimony, your experiences that you gave. Now they have to actually engage that rather yep. than you, the person. And so, yes, I'm guilty for setting that up, but uh, well, uh, I do. I, can I, I answer do that real quick? That. Yeah, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you really quick. One of the things that I found most effective is to counter the racist and the stereotypical mentality that Democrats always and liberals always try to slap on people. So my father is from Guatemala. So they had a 36 year war that caused the one of the most horrific genocides of all time. Um, I wrote a paper and it was presented and it's archived in the UN on just how horrific that was. So I know what a fascist government looks like. My father was stabbed 17 times in the chest. This is what, this is my counter. My father was stabbed 17 times in the chest, rolled up on a blanket and dropped off at the Texas border or at the Texas, um, it was the Houston courthouse as a message. My uncle went back to Guatemala and he was dead in two weeks. I know what a fascist socialist government the end game is. So not interested in that. I also come from Miami where there's lots of Cubans. You do not see Cubans rowing their boats back to Cuba for that good medicine. No, because that's the end game. That's what happens. If, you're, if your government decides to go truly socialist, then they stop participating in the global market. When they stop participating, because that's capitalism. Be clear, the global market is a capitalist enterprise, is not a socialist enterprise. Socialist enterprises, I've got these potatoes and you've got those tomatoes, let's swap. <laughs> that's a more socialist or the government comes in and slaps you both in the head and say, why do you have those potatoes and tomatoes? You selfish garbage off to re-education you go. And then they distribute a chunk of potato and tomato to everybody because there's not enough to go around. You have your two out, you know, there, there's two outcomes for that. Either way, it's very unfair to the person who grew right. the potatoes and tomatoes. Um, so I have firsthand experience of what it's like to grow up with people who escaped a socialist government. I live now in a more moderate, but now more and more becoming more dictatorial because I've heard the 13 years, I've kind of seen this kind of evolve, um, more dictatorial socialist government who is now in partnership with China, um, who can't now can't back out of it, right? Because there's always that threat of wrecking the economy. Our housing market is going to collapse because of all the money laundering that Chinese, the Chinese government and their actors did in our housing market, which made it unattainable for the average person. And a lot of people think in a socialist government that we're all going to sit around like Jesus, who, you know, made sure everybody was fed fairly and multiplied the loaves and fishes. Well, we're not Jesus and we're not multiplying anything. It just doesn't work that way. On top of it, there is a stronger hierarchy and a much more limited and tamped down ability to move and mobilize. So meritocracy is not a thing that's going to happen in a communist regime. It just doesn't happen. And a lot of people also seem to misunderstand that somehow socialism in and of itself will act independently. But one read of Mao's book. And this is where literature comes not only as something that delivers those ideological mentalities. And some of the greatest thinkers in the United States said the war is going to be a war of ideology. And socialism always uses ideology first, always, without exception, always. So you, when you train people to think that I, as a Hispanic, who happens to be a woman, who's raised five kids on her own, who grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood is somehow disadvantaged, my answer to that is, I have probably more privilege than the average person. So don't put that on me. Don't put your stereotypical racist, you know, um, judgmental nonsense. I mean, you don't know me. Don't generalize. The majority of people that I am friends with who are people of color, like you see on my Facebook, I got every shade, every walk of life from every country. We all share privilege. I This is not my first time through university. Um, I have had some very comfortable positions in life. 
equally some uncomfortable positions in life. You know, you get to 50, you get a little, you get some, you get some road rash on you. Um, I have access to education. I have access to legal representation. And in Canada, importantly, I have access to better medical than the majority of Canadians because I have access to health insurance, which is not a given here. And that's a whole nother thing to talk about, but it's important, right? Um, I have access to freedom of mobility. I have access to speak publicly. I have a lot more. I, so I have great privilege. So when people say that to me, first I drown them with my cards of, you know, this is all the things I am to shut them up. Cause that's what they, they only understand um, antagonism. Yeah. And I also happen to be a First Nations person, right? Guatemala, if you're a Latin American, you have African blood and you have Indian blood. So you're just the whole mix up, right? You're like a soup. You just got a little bit of everything in there. Uh, so like, what can they say to me, right? I come from an extremely privileged family. My grandfather made the key for Miami. He was a, uh, he was a photographer for the president of Puerto Rico. My grandmother was a landowner. Like what lack of privilege? Like, it's just ridiculous. So as soon as they start talking that nonsense, I just quickly put them in their place. And the majority of my friends who are people of color are educated professionals. And the sad part is Democrats have done such a good job with their ideology that you have people who are third and fourth generation professional medical field lawyers who see themselves as oppressed. You have movie stars like Beyonce and Jay-Z. They see themselves or they're talking the talk because I don't trust them because they're part of that mouthpiece. They see themselves as oppressed. And the term systematic is another term that erases any bad actor's culpability and responsibility for what they do. Rebecca, I have to say it's, uh, I've really enjoyed this uh, interview. I, I love how you bring a sarcastic humor side to something uh, boring. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that those who hear this will gain an insight behind what's constantly put out there as ideology that this is good, this is good, this is better. And, and you're not even questioning it. Um, listen to those who've been to these places and, uh, and gain for yeah. it. Uh, Rebecca, again, it's been a pleasure to have you on this show. Uh, perhaps Thank in the you. future we can have you on again. Uh, maybe I can be on your next upcoming show and you not get fired over it again. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. And we can, uh, we can uh, see where that leads to, but uh, I thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you for having me. And my next show will be in the great land of the United States where I do have the freedom of speech. So then I'll just have to deal with trolls and angry people. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. Welcome back to Rage of the Age as we enter into our essay segment. I hope that you've enjoyed the discussion that we've had talking about free speech, uh, especially as it comes from a Canadian perspective. Uh, and also considering, well, what does that do with us here that's a very important consideration to think about in this nation because there has been a growing trend in recent years where many have called for the uh, basically the abolishment of free speech or limiting it in certain fashions uh, where it's not given as much credibility as it once had in this nation. And, and this basically comes down to two particular opposing views in how this issue is often approached. Uh, the first view is going to be uh, your speech can be curtailed if it is offensive or hateful. Uh, and because of that, you know, it, it should be stopped because your speech is causing side effects that is adverse to society at large. And therefore, we are justified in inhibiting your free speech. Uh, the reason uh, for this approach is there's a concern that the for the disadvantaged and for those who can't speak for themselves. Uh, they believe that off offense causes dissension and violence, so peaceful measures are necessary to be sought after and they see this as a way of promoting peace. Hate speech causes uh, racism, misogyny, and other forms of uh, inferiority complexes. And that being the case, they see that as a reason, that's their justification, if you will, in order to curb certain speeches out of fear that it might promote these things amongst those who listen to it. 
Uh, on the opposite side of the fence, you have a different view. You have those who see free speech as an inalienable right, and you must not suppress it. Uh, it is a, a true and free republic, and if that's what we are to be, that can only exist if there is free speech. Free speech is considered necessary if we are to speak out against injustice or government outreach or things that are outrageous. We see it as a necessity that without free speech, you can't even address the issue. We believe that our conscience is only truly free if we can truly speak freely and that to be forced to agree with something without having the ability to voice otherwise is oppression itself upon our souls. The difficulty I see with the first position that, that we can in some cases inhibit speech is that if you suppress one, then you justify suppressing others. If you create the precedent that there are times where, if necessary for, as it usually goes, the greater good, then we can then take this right in order to promote a more peaceful society uh, for everybody to live in. And it's usually okay if you see it as someone else who is being silenced. But I have to ask you, what will you do if you're the one next that someone comes after you in order to silence you. Now, there are many of you who are listening here for a variety of reasons, some of them very bogus reasons where, for example, your Facebook post had been um, sanctioned in some way, or I, I've seen this thing where people have been in Facebook jail because of something they post. And now it's humorous, and we treat it like a joke, but that's just a taste of what's to come if we justify silencing opposition based upon the potential harm their voice might have. Some of you have had your stuff censored for the most silliest of things, things that weren't even true, and you were frustrated because Facebook didn't even listen to your explanation that, well, what was accused against me is not even true. Well, it doesn't matter. They just well, we're not going to deal with it. We're going to make the community play along, get along at all costs, and therefore they censor certain things. But as you can see, they tend to favor censoring one group of speech, but not so much other groups. And this is the grand concern that many of us have about this right of free speech, especially concerning when you think you should or should not turn it off. Because it will always be used by your political opponents to turn it off for you, but they will make sure that no such breaks are put upon themselves. Therefore, you only have one side and their voice prevailing and the other one actively suppressed. And this is done under the guise of for the greater good, to protect those who can't speak for themselves and all the other reasons that have been given to justify such an action. But this is a dangerous precedent that this nation should not delve into. And as you had seen today, there's, there's this misconception, like when we look at nations like Canada and, and I know Germany has been brought up, Sweden and all these different places and these golden socialist paradises that they have. Uh, the United Kingdom sometimes makes that list. Uh, the information is just poor. You're, the examples are one little snapshot of an entire lifestyle that these people live that I'll just bluntly tell you, if you had to impose all of their measures that they live under right now on this country, many of you, even you who say that you're liberal, you would balk at the ideas and the things you would have to go through that they go through. You heard a bit of that today in this discussion earlier with our interview from someone who had lived in Canada for 13 years, who had been educated in their systems on how to think and what to do, and she saw how there's just, there's no freedom of speech there in that nation. Before you go screaming, we should be like Canada. We should be like Germany. We should be like 
uh, Sweden or the United Kingdom or you pick a random country most of you have never even been to, you need to think what you're really asking for. Again, it may sound good to you because you believe your voice won't be the one that's silenced. You think it'll be the people you don't like who will be silenced. But I am telling you, all you have to do is slightly be a threat to the government, real or imagined, and you're going to be silenced. And if that's what you want, have at it. But many of us do not want that position, especially in this nation, founded on a very basic premise that we have the right of free speech and that it is not to be inhibited in any way that i may speak freely my conscience and you may freely speak your conscience if we start picking and choosing based upon the notion of offense who should be allowed to speak and who should not be allowed to speak we have opened up something very ugly that i don't think we are prepared to go through and I believe many of you who are calling for such actions, you really don't know what you're asking for because you believe you're the one who's not going to be silenced. You think only those that you view as bad and evil will be silenced, but you have no idea how far this can be applied. And when you give your government this much power to curtail what you're allowed to say or not say, you've crossed a threshold that is not easy to cross back over. You have surrendered something that is considered inalienable. Our Constitution calls it our rights, inalienable rights. There are certain inalienable rights that God has given us as mankind to enjoy. And one of these things is to speak freely our conscience. Can you imagine being not able to express what you think or feel, and that if you do, there's repercussions to come of that. That's what you're asking for when you're saying we need to curtail certain types of speeches. Because it might seem as if that's a great idea in these gross cases where people are just so crazy, no one listens to them anyway. But what happens when the accusation is made and it's not even true because you're just a political opponent. Well, what you said is offensive. It doesn't matter if it is or not. If that's reason enough to silence you, and if I'm your political opponent and I know it will work against you, chances are there's going to be a lot of people tempted to take that route and silence their opposition by simply labeling something as offensive happens all the time. You can say that something is hate speech and there's not an element of hate in it. You just assume, well, your conclusion is this and I see that as something hateful. Therefore, what you're saying is hate speech. You've ignored everything they've just said. You just hate their conclusion. There is no exchange of ideas. There's no free exchange of ideas. There is no active debate. There is no true sense of democracy in a, in a republic or any other form. You cannot tell me that you enjoy freedoms if you are for eliminating any type of free speech. This includes speech which you do not want to hear. And I want to conclude this segment by just saying something very simple. Your offense does not in any way cancel out my right to free speech. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, I want to encourage you to recommend this to others on your social media. You can do that by going to Twitter, write a recommendation, and then hashtag it with Rage of the Age Now, which is the handle of the podcast on Twitter. Hashtag Rage of the Age Now. You can also go to Facebook, find our page, which is called Rage of the Age. Uh, as it comes up, click the reviews. You can go into the review section, click yes to recommend, write in your review of the show, and post it there to the page. 
this is going to be important for the next few weeks because each week I am going to give away a copy of my book called Not in the Wind, Earthquake, or Fire. And this book is a first-hand account of my second deployment to Iraq from the perspective of a combat infantryman. And it is full of many spiritual insights. And I want to give a copy of this book away. I'm going to give away one a week for the next 10 weeks. And the way that's going to be done is, is if you leave a review and recommend Rage of the Age on Twitter or Facebook, that week I will select someone who gives that recommendation and I will send them a copy of Not in the Wind, Earthquake, or Fire for free to someone who recommends Rage of the Age. I'd like to end this episode by asking the question of the week. Every week at the end of the episode, I ask a question that is meant to be discussed for the rest of the week and considered for its merits. And this week's question is, is free speech worth fighting for? And the way this works is, is I will post this question, the weekly question, on the Rage of the Age Now Twitter account, and I will ask this question, is freedom of speech worth fighting for? And when you find that, you can comment on that question and respond to the question. It's also going to be posted on the Facebook page, which is Rage of the Age on Facebook, and I will type it in as a post asking the question, is free speech worth fighting for? And you can respond there with your answer as well. At the beginning of the episode next week, I will then review some of those responses from that question at the beginning of the show. Once again, is free speech worth fighting for? You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you love today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.